one of the things I've got in trouble for saying, which is true anyways, is that you don't grow up till you have kids. And people who don't have kids who think they're growing up take exception to that. And I can understand why, but I don't really care because you're not mature until someone matters more than you do. And that, unless there's something wrong with you, like seriously wrong, and that happens to people, if you have kids, that will happen to you. You know, and you might say you could be committed to something else with equal intensity. It's like, yeah, maybe. I doubt it, but maybe. You know, there might be one person in a thousand who's capable of taking on a burden that's equivalent, let's say, to care for a child in some other form, care for an ailing relative, for example, or a sibling, or maybe even sacrificial love for a husband or a wife. Very rare. Very rare. What maturity does that give you to have children? He got married recently. Yeah. So he's, you know, thinking about the idea of it. Well, you're responsible. They're obviously fragile in a very fundamental way. And that's your problem. So you better have your eyes open. And there's lots of ways you can foul up. And the thing about kids, they're perfect. And you can really muck that up. Now, you can also encourage their development and, and facilitate the maintenance of that sort of paradisal quality of being. You want to do that within the confines of your house. And that's great. Like my experience with, ch with children was they certainly, I mean, I like children. I used to work in daycares when I was like 18. I really liked little kids. And so I never felt my kids to be a burden. When I was working as a professor at Harvard, you know, I basically stripped my life down to work and my family. That was it. There was nothing else. And that was fine. I mean, I loved my work. And so that was fine. But my family was a very good break from my work and very rewarding. I mean, most of the time, if I had my choice, I'd rather hang around with my kids. That's always, that's been the case my whole life. It's still the case now. They're unbelievably rewarding. So the thing about kids, this is something that's very useful to know. The relationship you have with your child will be the only relationship you ever have in your life that starts with the following on the following presumption. There's nothing that child wants more than to have the best possible relationship with you. They 100% want that. That's right on the table for you. You know, now people find that daunting and they're afraid of it and no wonder, but it's an unbelievably high quality relationship. How does it bring in maturity though? Because you're contending with their fragility, you there's errors that your errors are, the consequence of your errors are radically multiplied. Okay. Right. And it, it's not just you that's on the hook for your stupidity. It's your kids and they're not responsible for your stupidity. You might be, but you know, so if you conduct yourself in a manner that makes them suffer, well, then you're contributing to the suffering of the innocent. That's for sure. And so, you know, you become aware of that and that. I mean, part of your question, your question has to be answered in part by discussing what it means to be mature. The more forward-looking you are, the more mature you are. The more your actions in the present are bound by the future. That's one definition of maturity. So even in relationship to yourself, you know, well, why not drink and have fun? Well, how about because there's tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Or your career. All right. You know, or the you're at a fairly high level of attainment and you do something foolish when you're drunk. It might even just be a word that's spoken improperly or carelessly. It's like it damages your reputation because people are expecting more for, from you than that. And if you violate that, then all sorts of doors that you didn't even know were there slam shut. And so you're orienting yourself to a longer view of, of life. That's partly what Christ is referring to when he talks about life eternal. You start to view your life not as the moment-to-moment -moment happening, but the entire pattern, perhaps not only across the span of your life, but like a multi-generational span. And then the other element of maturity is that it's not about you. Like, it's partly about you, but it's just as much about your wife, and it's just about as much about, it's just as much about your kids, and then your community, right? And so, instead of you being focused on self-centered gratification in the immediate present, you're looking more for something like harmony on the social front. So you and your wife are getting along, right? There's a har harmony established. Then your kids and your wife and you are getting along, and that's a harmony. 
that's a much better view also of, men, of mental health. Hmm. You know, one of the disservices that the psychological and psychiatric community have done in the last hundred years is imbue people with the conviction that mental health is something that's in your head and that's yours. That's complete bloody nonsense. That isn't how it works at all. Like, you can't be mentally healthy if your wife is miserable. Well, that's not in your head. Your stability is dependent on the harmony of your social surround, and it's dependent on the integration of the present with the future. And the more mature you are, the better you are at taking all that into account at every moment. So and there's, there's a strange thing that goes along with that. So in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, which is a series of instructions, by the way. So Christ tells his followers, first of all, to aim up. And so you could, you could think of that ultimately, and, and the ultimate expression of that would be something like your attempt to establish a relationship with the transcendent or the divine. It's a difficult thing to define, but you can think about it more prosaically as well, which is, well, if you can think of something better that you could be doing, practically in any of the dimensions of life that you're exploring, aim at that. You know, you might say, well, I don't know what the ultimate pinnacle of goodness is. It's like, fair enough, but there's some proximal goods that you're probably aware of. Like one of the questions people can generally ask, answer is, well, what stupid things are you doing to muck up your life that you know about, that you could quit doing, that you would quit doing? It might be a short list, but it's something. It's like, well, there's an upward orientation there. That upward orientation can magnify as it's practiced, and that's part of the establishment of a religious mode of being. Anyways, you orient yourself upwards. Right? Then you assume that other people have the same intrinsic value that you do, and then you concentrate on the moment. And then you can have your cake and eat it too, because you get the pleasure of being immersed in the moment. And there isn't anything in some sense that's deep, a deeper source of meaning than that, but that's predicated on the proper distal orientation, right? So Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount that you should be like the lilies of the field, right? That they don't toil and they don't spin. They're not Machiavellian. They're not Machiavellian in their orientation. They're not always trying to twist the fabric of reality so they get what they want. It's like, no, aim up then concentrate on the moment. And that those two, those things should inform each other. You can imagine, here, here's an example of that. So you can imagine appearing on a podcast with Machiavellian intent to sell something, for example. Or you could imagine following the thread of the conversation wherever it goes, assuming that the goal is to have the most engaging conversation possible. Those are very difficult, different orientations. If your orientation is towards engagement in the conversation and you've set that frame, then you can concentrate on the moment and look for the opportunities that make themselves manifest in relationship to that goal. And you can do that always in your life, constantly. That's what a religious practice is for, so that you're doing that at every moment. Technically, that's what it's, hmm. that's what it's for. You and that's way different than a hedonic motivation. It's, they're not the same thing at all. 